This is the Horse Radio Network. This is Episode 9 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Index Fund Advisors, IFA.com. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of Horse Radio Network. Today, we have some icons in the horse industry where youth is concerned, both horse and human. We welcome some special guests from Sweden and New Zealand who are making a difference for horses and horsemanship as lifelong students of horse behavior. Thank you for supporting our sponsors to make this show possible. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to Horsemanship Radio. Welcome back, everyone. Horsemanship Radio airs the 15th and the 30th of the month. I have my producer, Glenn the Geek, with me. Hi, Glenn. Hey, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Terrific. Now, um, I'll tell you what. We've been getting some emails and things from people who are enjoying the show, and I just wanted to say right at the top of the show that we really do like that. If you are enjoying listening to Debbie and you like Horsemanship Radio, drop us an email and let us know if uh, if there's something that uh, you would like to hear on, on Horsemanship Radio or a specific guest you would like to hear. We want to know about it. We do. That'd be great. I would love to not be the only one thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to hear what they want to hear. <laughs> and, and I've had so much fun talking to different people, but we certainly can expand the different kinds of uh, disciplines and uh, horsemanship behavioral issues that we, we get into here. So please do give us feedback. And uh, Glenn, I hear you're going off to a trade show here. What are you up to these days? Yeah, we have a trade show this weekend. It's twice a year. It's the American Equestrian Trade Association. It's the uh, wholesaler retail trade show. So the retailers go there to see new stuff that's coming out and to buy things. So it's a very, it's a pretty large show. It's in Philadelphia over the weekend with uh, all the snow and cold. So I. For it's her, a real yeah. tough one for us because we have to leave sunny Ocala to go to Philadelphia in the middle of winter. Yeah, that's nuts. That's yeah. nuts. You're actually, <laughs> are you going to buy anything there? Do you have something to look forward to buy no. there or anything? Actually, Stop they it? bring us in uh, at every one of these to cover the show and to highlight new products. And we do our live show, Horses in the Morning, from there on Monday morning. So it's uh, we're working the whole time. Uh, but they do have cash and carry on Monday. So Jennifer does take advantage of that. Oh, good girl. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Jennifer will have to tell us about her, her uh, accomplishments when she comes yes. back. And we'd like to hear more about, more about how you uh, dress for these things when you have to leave Ocala. It must be hard to put anything on but, but boots. Mm-hmm. Uh, you kind of, uh, we, we have to dig the winter stuff out. We have to find it yeah. and then pack it. Yeah, because we, we really haven't used it at this point. So uh, <laughs> it's our little taste of snow every year. Uh, well, I guess you didn't get it at Christmas, so you're going to get it now. That's right. Huh? That's right. And you look who's talking, you out there in warm California. Oh, shh. Okay, that's true. <laughs> we are having a heat wave. <laughs> well, I'm excited today about a couple of the guests that we have coming on. We've got some uh, international flavor, and I hope everybody, they have to hunker down to their mics really carefully and listen to these accents. Uh Anne Lindbergh in Sweden, uh, she speaks great English. I'm not worried about her a bit. She's writing a book both in English and Swedish. Uh, so she will be very um, uh, lucid and amazing in her horse behavior uh, knowledge and the years and years she goes back with natural horsemanship uh, and working with horses since she was a child and becoming one of the early instructors in Monty Roberts concepts and join up and she mentors a lot of a lot of kids out there too and then uh, you're going to hear an amazing story from Lee Wills in New Zealand who has together with one of uh, Monty Roberts' other instructors, both of those being instructors, have put together for the last decade, more than, uh, a tremendous program for thoroughbred babies. And they take them from birth all the way to their first jobs and how they work with the mental and physical aspects of bringing those babies up. So our next guest has devoted her life to horses everywhere, but was born and raised and lives in Sweden. After this... Hi, I'm Mark Hebner, president of Index Fund Advisors and proud owner of Monty Roberts Willing Partners graduate, He's a Sugar Bear. (laughs) You know, investment portfolios are a lot like horses. 
you need to find one that best suits you, your temperament, and your stage of life. Some people might like an energetic horse and an aggressive investment portfolio, while others are more comfortable with a gentle ride and a more conservative investment portfolio. The trick is to find the one that's right for you. That's what Index Fund Advisors is all about, matching people with portfolios, risk-appropriate, low-cost, and globally diversified investment portfolios. You can find the right portfolio for you by taking the Risk Capacity Survey at ifa.com, that's IFA as an Index Fund Advisors, or you can call us toll-free at 888-643-3133. That's 888-643-3133. Ann Lindbergh is one of Sweden's leading opinion builders in equine behavior and a longtime Monty Roberts certified instructor. Anne helps educate horse owners and equine entrepreneurs who seek a deeper understanding of their horses. Anne's worked with a variety of horses, from the BLM Mustangs in Nevada to tourism in Mallorca, Spain. And she's, she's writing a book right now about um, experiences and about her horsemanship. She is writing this both in English and Swedish, so we'll be able to get to a little, learn a little bit more from her. And it's really about building relationships in the equine industry. Welcome, Anne Lindbergh. Thanks for coming oh. on, Anne. Well, thank you very much, Debbie. This is a privilege, and I'm honored to be on, on an American radio. That's so fun, and I've heard, well, we will make sure that the rest of the world will hear us as well, I understand. That's right. This is Internet, Brave New World. We're going to be all over it. Oh, uh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I want to share you with a lot of people that uh, tune in to Horsemanship Radio because you're one of those in the Scandinavian area that is a real thought leader in the industry. And I love how you're mentoring so much youth up there and that you're um, studying equine behavior. Tell us a little bit about what your day looks like. Oh, my day is just filled with joy, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. And a lot of learning and teaching, but uh, I, I love your topics today, and especially with, with the young people, because to me, you know, I'm only 46, so I'm not that old, but uh, mm -hmm. seeing the young people uh, and understanding how extremely influenced they are by the industry, uh, you know, and they have their role models, and, and it's often today uh, the top riders, and they see only, you know, like we say, the, the cream of the top uh, and the good stuff. But uh, the, the youth and the young people, they are the future for, for the rest of the horses in the world. Um, so to mm. me, the children are precious. And the, the young girls and, and boys that are out there uh, that love the horses, they, they need uh, good role models. And I'm, I'm doing my, my part of it, I hope. Yes, you are. Um, we introduced you as having experience with horses all over the world. Have you worked with some young people that are doing things in your area that are uh, making a difference as well? Oh, definitely. Uh, first off, the funny thing is that wherever you go, you will always find a little girl or a little boy standing, you know, by the paddock or the, the pastures. And uh, that fascinates me because I was I was one of those. Uh, girls that was just standing there and, and, and just admiring the horses. Uh, mm -hmm. What I do like is that children, they don't have any agenda. And, and when you just give them that opportunity to, to smile and start to ask questions, it is mm -hmm. like it's so easy for them to understand, you know, when you have that. Uh, on my courses, I actually have, uh, we have something that we call parent and pony camps. Mm -hmm. And because we kind of, in a nice and good way, uh, um, demand that, that the parents are involved as well with the love that the children have with the ponies. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's just a thrill to have, you know, both the, the parents and, and the children there. And we can, you know, give some horsemanship 101 because many parents in Sweden, they don't have uh, the experience or the knowledge about a horse. Today, yeah. anybody can buy a, a, you know, a pony or a horse. And, and what it's based on is actually just love for the horse from yeah. the child's point of view. So uh, I was amazed 
uh, this year when Monte Roberts was at fleeing a stud farm. Um, uh, first year Monte was in Sweden, it was in 2005, and there's a school, it's an equine school at the fleeing a stud farm here in, in the south of Sweden, and there was three students from the school in 2005. This year, or last year, was actually in April 2013, there was 192 registered students at Fleeing It, and there wow. were 192 people sitting in there and watching Monty. And you know, Look like you say, with Internet and the blogs, and you could mm-hmm. say, what are we doing? We should stop complaining and keep, you know, start working. So, yeah, yeah that's one of my missions in life. That's a great mission. That's yeah. that's a great growth too. Two thousand five. Yeah, so, and you do you um, do you credit that with the internet and with the forums and things blogs that are going on, or do you credit it with just a rising interest in horsemanship? No, I'm I'm I don't know if there's a difference in countries, you know, and traditions and whatever. But in the blogs and forums that we have in Sweden, it's it, it's um, it's huge. I mean, we even have 14 and 15 year old girls with their own blogs, and they're actually making money on it, oh. uh, which I find very strange. But that's the way it is today. Uh, mm-hmm. But I always try to, how do you say it in English? Uh, you know, try to to contact them or reach out to the people that really have mm-hmm. values in what they say because they become a good role model for other young people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and and I, th- I, I, it's important. I, I feel it's important because today, as we say, with Internet, it's both good and bad. You know, mm-hmm. they, the young people, they want fast answers. They want uh, quick fixes. Uh, mm-hmm. And they want to move forward very, very fast. And I think before, just 20 years ago, when we read books, you came deeper into knowledge and, you know, thoughts, you, you, you had more time to think and rational about your, your own thoughts. But today you want fast answers. So I think it's important to really reach out to, the, to those who have uh, the ability to speak up mm-hmm. and that have good values. Yeah, how do you determine when you're looking at a um, a blog or a forum, a lot of people are contributing on there and they're really trying to be helpful, I'm sure. How how do people discern? Well, um, that's a good question. <laughs> First of all, I think, you know, as I said, I am, I'm not that 20-year-old girl anymore, but I have been 20-year-old and I know how you spoke and how you thought and so on. I think it's important for us that that wants to, you know, lead the way a little or, or, or take the opportunity to to have opinions and, and, and try to get a movement going on. Uh, we need to understand how children and young people talk and how mm-hmm. they think. Um, and, and try to meet them at you know, at their level and on their roads uh, instead of, you know, complaining or saying, oh, you don't listen, and, you know, that, that we have maybe from, from our parents. Uh, that, I think that's a good start. And um, I'm lucky. I have a lot of students of my own uh, in, in our school here uh, with the name of Monte Roberts. And, mm-hmm. and we have decided uh, to have a code of ethics because we want to be part of the forums and, you know, the blogs and, and Facebook and stuff. And, and we have come to an agreement, all of us, we're thir- I have 35 students today, and we've come to that agreement that we shall never uh, complain, never be harsh, always try to find, you know, the empathy. And if, if, if we hear somebody say, oh, I need help because my horse is stupid, then we do not look at that person as it is as it is a stupid person, or that they have a stupid horse either. We yeah. we really want to you know bring out the good and 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 um, get to it in, in, in from another direction. Very good, very good. I know you've been wonderful on our Equus Online University. We have that forum. We put 
badges on uh, all the instructors so that people recognize them as they go yeah. through the forum. And you're on there quite a yeah. lot. And, I, and I'm yeah. so glad. It's a very nice forum and very well directed, but it is great to have some weight in there from you. And I'm sure that uh, all the blogs try to achieve that. I think we've, we've uh, been really fortunate to have uh, really well, thank kind you very people. Much. I, I find, you know, I learn. I learn a lot by reading on the mm-hmm. Echoes Online University. I even try to, you know, get ahead of my own students uh, to, <laughs> to make it right on the, on the lessons. Uh, mm-hmm. But also, you know, it's so much easier to say, well, if we, when you talk to whether it's your students or, or, you know, horse owners that we call it, or on blogs and stuff, and you can say, you know, there's great videos out there, uh, and, and then you can get that, you know, that little extra feedback just so people start to nice. think the right way. So That's it, great. It, it's great. It's absolutely super. Mm-hmm. Good. So there's a uh, there's a lot going on out there. What is it about the little girl leaning on the fence, looking in the horses that is uh, just like you when you were little <laughs> that is so attracted to horses? And how can we foster that? How can we keep that going? Oh yeah, isn't that one of the life mission that we all have? Mm-hmm. Um, it's just pure love, you know. Uh, and pure amazement of that beauty in the horse. Um, the way they move and the way they look at you and I think also the way horses view the world, you know, when they're out there in the pasture. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's one of, of those things that I'm, I'm going to bring out a lot in my book and, and that I always talk about in my demonstrations, um, that we sh- we need to find a way to never forget that little moment that you remember mm-hmm. uh, when you look, you know, at the horse. And um, I, I find it difficult today in the world that in the society that we live in. There's a lot of, of things happening in the world. And, um, uh, but also, even though it could be rebellion and all that, it is you know, people are actually fighting for for the kindness today, I think. Or I feel that, especially here in Europe. Uh, and and um, I, I don't think it's that difficult to bring it out in the horse world, actually, to be honest with you. Uh, the other side of it, unfortunately, is that, that we see a lot of trauma going on in England and Ireland, especially with horses. Mm-hmm. Horses are dumped uh, alongside the roads. Souls are killed, uh, and uh, you know that brings. Even though it's the toughest thing, and you cry every time you see it on the internet, it still brings out that uh, little fighting spirit in you. With you know the love, the love for yeah. the horse, and yeah. we need to grasp on or hold on to that really, really hard, and and become better and better to um, express it one way really or nice. another. Yeah. So you're saying that actually can bring out the compassion and, and gets yeah. us shaken from our from our busy world. Very yeah, good. I think so. Yeah, that's a nice sentiment. That's a nice sentiment. So um, parents, I know, are looking for um, something that horses bring out in their children. Not only responsibility, and I guess we've mentioned love and okay. language. How how is it that a parent can f- I, besides go to your courses and send their kids to your courses, what would a parent, if, uh, if you're in the U.S. right now, what would you recommend a parent do to begin this journey to get their, horse, their kids involved with horses? Well, you know, as I said, that, um, that little tip that I have and that I will bring out in my book, you know, when, when you have that child, if you're a parent and you see you have a lot of love for your child, right, and you want to... Mm-hmm fill that uh, child's world with love. And then you need to look at your child and, and see how they view that horse that they have in front of them. And, and that's what it's all about. It's about, uh, of course, we want to pamper our children. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as you said, it's compassion and so forth. Uh, but you also learn that responsibility you as a grown-up person will ask the child 
to actually take care of this uh, beautiful horse. Uh, but you, as a grown-up, need to be there and, and actually take on the responsibility to, to want to learn as much as you can about horses uh, so that you can support your child in that love and that responsibility that they have with the, with the horse. Uh, I see many parents in, in Sweden, you know, it's the other children. They have a horse. Mom, I want a horse. Well, I don't have the time. If I, you know, buy a horse to my daughter, then she can take care of the horse, and then I know that she's in the stable and she's not out, you know, on t- at, at town running around. Um, mm-hmm. It's not easy for parents today, but it's still our mm-hmm. responsibility as grown-ups. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, good. Well, we will have to have you back. I'd like to hear more, um, a tip from you, maybe a little, can we get a little preview of your book, maybe a tip from your book? Absolutely, absolutely. Is that right? Great. Thank you, Anne Lindbergh, for joining us today for a quick talk about the state of horsemanship in Sweden. Thank Thank you you. for all you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Our next guest hails all the way down under from New Zealand. After this. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts, and I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it too on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced rider. It doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online too on our forum, and there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. Lee Wills, one of the first instructors in Monty Roberts Concepts, has helped write the curriculum for his school at Flag is Up Farms. Lee returned to New Zealand in 2000 and set up Equus Education in New Zealand, and a limited organization, they call those businesses limiteds, to organize tours and teach for Monty in her native land. Her students have progressed and taken Monty's teachings to a huge variety of chosen careers from instructors at the zoo, they work with the elephants, and private horses, and world champions. Uh, They uh, participate in the mounted games. She has students in almost every discipline. Alongside teaching, both Lee and Sally, also a Monty Roberts instructor, Sally King, have spent the past 10 years, uh, more than that now, specializing in the education of over 2,000 thoroughbred foals, completing approximately 15,000 training sessions. They're graduates from Equus Education, that's the horses, process, become uh, million-dollar yearlings in the sales ring, and they've matured into winners of multiple Group 1 races. And they conduct equine behavior research, too, on a quest to continue sharing their knowledge that they have gained. Welcome, Lee Wills from New Zealand. Thanks for calling us from Down Under. Thanks so much, Stevie. It's great to hear your voice. Good to hear yours, too. What have you been up to down there? If folding season is over, what did, what did your day look like during that hectic time? Well, it is a busy time for us. We're very lucky, and we are the only foal, hand, foal educators that are allowed on site at our thoroughbred studs in New Zealand. So we are very privileged to be able to drive around the beautiful stud farms with their lovely hedges and lovely black fencing and full of posts and rails and loads and loads of mares and foals and just go from paddock to paddock visiting. Yeah, how many babies at any one time do you have there, Lee? Well, this, it's really up to the studs. Some of the studs have us that we work with all their babies. So probably our biggest client would be a stud down in New Zealand called Windsor Park Stud and we do their first 80 foals for them plus clients. So and so they're quite untouched, but we've found a really good time for us to work with them is between three and six weeks of age. So that's when we start with them. So they're out in the paddocks, and we just bring them in for their session and then put them back. So, And we do that individually with each one. Mm-hmm. And we've found it kind of takes us between six and nine sessions per foal for them to graduate, what we call graduate with us. Mm-hmm. So they are able to be approached and halted and led and have their feet picked up and everything and all ready to kind of continue on. It's a real introduction for them because they are born into the thoroughbred racing industry here in New Zealand and we're trying to kind of get them so that they can 
are able to cope with pressure, I suppose, is a lot of the things, because we can't really set them up for everything that's going to happen to them in racing. So it's mm. really giving them a good introduction and trying to get them to understand how they can think through and work through processes. Brilliant. That is such a cool, what a responsibility, but such a cool job. I'm mm-hmm, sure there's a few mm-hmm. people who would love to be able to work with babies all day. But I love how you and Sally have this system that you've broken down scientifically. How, uh, how many mm. years have you been working on this? Well, Sally and I, we, we kind of, we started, um, I first started, I mean, Sally's kind of a couple of years behind, but when I say behind, we've both been doing it. It's about 11 years now. We've done, we think wow. it must be close to about 15,000 sessions we've done with these mares and foals, and we've learnt so much over the time that are, are specific to the foals, and we have got some research running as well, but... We're kind of, Sally and I, really at the stage now where we would like to share a lot of this information, well, all of the information that we've learnt, because mm-hmm. we never realised how specific it actually was to the foals. So we're trying to learn a little bit more about kind of anatomically or where they are in their development stages. We've been, so we, we organised the system first and we've really learnt it from the horses. And now what we're trying to do is go back and work out kind of why what we're doing works. So that's at the process where we are just writing it all down at the moment. So hence why Caroline Jennings is able to be over here helping us as well, which is great. So that that Sally and I, we've got someone who it's fresh to, so she can kind of ask us questions because for Sally and I, it's very much what we've been doing for so many years now, even though it does keep evolving for us each season as well. I I love this. I think one of the important things that I've read and heard about what you're doing is that you you go in and you um, acclimate the babies to humans, but then Mm -hmm. you let them go back and you let them bond and you let them be a part of the horse world first. Mm -hmm. It's huge for us here in New Zealand. We there's how we first started is there's a gentleman called Sir Patrick Hogan. Who, was, who has been knighted for his services to racing here in New Zealand. And when I first started 11 years ago with the babies, he said to me, it was actually on his directive, and he asked that we wouldn't do anything to upset the mare and foal bond, and I didn't really realise at that time how important yeah. that was. So for us, the mare and foal bond, yeah. you know, is even if we managed to, even if we got a foal later on, if they are with the mare, if they've, been brought up naturally with the mare and with other mares and foals I think that is really is the most important thing we can always put the training into them later but I think Mm. if they kind of miss out on that socialization with the other foals to play with and they don't have a good bond with the mare and even with the mares we've kind of if we um we see a lot with the when we're trying to touch a foal for the first time you'll see like little um changes in the hair and the foal where the mare's been nibbling at the foal so we mm. find she does a lot like even probably medically like keeping those foals the foal's bodies well and mm. so we find that we tend to try and scratch them where the mare's been scratched and then we tend to start there and we found that the mares really do help us now in the education of the foal which is great so yeah so there's lots of things that we have learned about learned about it and it really has been from the horses yeah. So you said that you try to equip these babies with some sort of uh, um, ability to think before they get into mm. a high stress industry like the mm-hmm, thoroughbred industry. Mm-hmm. Is that a, a confidence that you're putting in them around humans or is that an intelligence uh, training, something? What are you doing to, to help them with that world they're going into? Yes, we would really like to understand a little bit more about it. We've seen a lot. And um, but we, um, I've just enrolled on another course because I'm trying to find out a little bit more. What we kind of believe at the moment is when we first, and it's maybe not just foals, it's even wild horses. Like when we first go to do anything with them, they've got two options. They can either give us a learnt response or an instinctive response. Now, mm-hmm. because the foals are new, there is no learnt response, so they only have an option to give us an instinctive response. And mm-hmm. what we find is that if we keep putting pressure on them so if they um if they start to get upset and we allow them to kind of keep moving and, and get more worried about it we find that they just continue and get more and more worried as in they'll leave us faster and fly off the walls faster and things mm. 
So we've found that over the years, what we we have found is better. And if I think of, you know, like Monty and the work with Temple Grandin and things, and things is that what we've found is it's we're really better to shut down as in physically stop that instinctive behaviour happening. So how mm-hmm. we do it is we've got pads and we've got the mare in a really safe place and we put the foal right up so she's, it's touching the mare, plus it's all padded and plus we've got us there. So, so we're all in a really close-knit kind of area. And what we've found is by physically shutting down that the physical instinctive behaviour, it seems to settle them in their mind quicker. And I think maybe it is just because it's all linked in their mind how they learn, like that physical, emotional and, and mental is all together. So we have found that that really works for us. That's great. Okay. I'm, I'm listening to that. So, so Wendy, you, are you doing uh, some science research behind this or are you just documenting at this point? No, we have um, with Waikato... With Waikato University here and Windsor Park, we do have a research project running. And what we were trying to find out is, with the babies, is one, are there any behavioural traits that we see at that age, at three to six weeks of age, that then go Mm -hmm. on to be very good racehorses? Mm -hmm. For us, it's like, what makes a successful racehorse? Can we see anything there? And the other thing we were trying to work out is how long the foals are remembering can give instant recall to... A behavior that we ask them so when I was talking about a foal having either an instinctive response or a learnt response so once we shut down that instinctive response and they start to learn these learnt responses it's really about doing it kind of over they learn it over and over and over until it becomes quite a strong neural pathway but what we have found is if the horses get pushed beyond what they believe they are capable of as in they get really upset about their environment and they go into like an instinctive reaction and they give you that instinctive response, they yeah. don't continue to stay in that learnt response. And yeah. for us, that I suppose is all about racing as and they're going to be put in the gates and they are going to be in high stress areas. And mm-hmm. so it's about how long they can hold those learnt responses for. Uh, so for good. us, we have found there, has, there was some research done about doing something under 42 days and, and if it lasts longer in the horse's in the foal's mind if it is done under 42 days. So it's okay. all about us trying to understand you know, what we can do because we're in a commercial environment, what we can do in the least amount of sessions that holds for them in those high-pressure situations. So initially it might be just a farrier comes in, that might be a big thing for those foals. So we are, we ourselves are trying to learn more, we do see a lot, and for me it's, it's probably really learning the scientific side of it, so then we can pass that on, so it's not as emotive as it can be for those horses at the moment as it is for some mm-hmm. of them. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that reminds me of what Monty says quite often, which is adrenaline up, learning down. Mm, adrenaline down, so. learning up. Yeah, yeah it yeah. is, isn't it? So, yes, uh, that's very nice. much. So for us, it's that same thing about that adrenaline. But for the little babies, what we find is probably like a child. You know, when they go under pressure, is they're more likely to give you a large instinctive response, like they can't keep thinking through and and stay kind of in a trained thought pattern, I suppose. So as soon as that adrenaline gets up, yeah, it's, it's, they definitely can't learn anymore, but it's seeing if they can hold what they existingly know, I suppose, for us. So interesting. Well, that's great. Is it a lot of fun too, Lee? Are you having a great time? Oh, oh, Sally always says we have the best job in the world, and we, <laughs> we of course think we do have the best job in the world. And for us, I suppose we're very fortunate because we well people are very trusting of us as and we just pull up at the studs and go in and do our work so most of the day uh, Sally and I are very much on our own doing our work so it's great to be in that position that we yeah are privileged enough just to be able to drive in places and go and deal with these gorgeous thoroughbreds so yeah. we're very fortunate Really nice. Well, I, I love all the students that you have produced over the years. I don't mm. want to make it sound like you're 150 or anything because you're very young. But oh, you I'm have produced... Well. <laughs> you're getting older. Oh, aren't we all? But uh, you have produced some fantastic trainers that have gone mm-hmm. on to work with elephants um, mm-hmm. at the Auckland Zoo, right? Yeah. Yes, and you've yes. 
you've produced people that have worked in the mounted games and mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. competitors and and all over the really all over the the map. So you must have this uh, the the behavioral part of horsemanship and also animal training down. And we would love to have you back, Lee. I'd love to get a a tip from you. I'd love our listeners to share more of you if you'll if you'll have us. You'll be back. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh, we'd love to. Okay. All right. We'll have you back then. I appreciate you um, coming on today and we're really excited to share with New Zealand and hope to get a lot of listeners listening in on this. Yes, very much so. And this week we have Ada Gates back for a training tip. Welcome back, Ada. We're so lucky to have you here for um, our tips on horsemanship radio. We'd love to hear more about some of the experience that you've had with the measuring of the hoof and some of the, the, the ways that you do that. Well, thank you, Debbie. I'm, I'm thrilled to be back. And um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but I can repeat it again, the, my goal and I think the goal for any farrier is that the hoof is trimmed so that 50% of the foot is in front of it, the center and 50% is behind. So it's a perfect seesaw, a perfect fulcrum, a perfect uh, balanced uh, point of articulation. And there's, we have the patent hoof ruler, which is on Monty's website, so, and that has all the instructions and reasons for doing this, but the one thing that sort of confirms that 50-50 is perfect is because the golden mean or pi perfectly applies to this balanced foot. And what mm -hmm. I mean to say by that is if you apply the golden mean, which is... Um, 5,000 years of thought about perfect balance. You'll see it in paintings. The facade of the Parthenon is pi. Uh, from one knuckle to another knuckle on your hand is pi. Mm. The universe is in perfect balance. And the Greeks discovered that. And the foot is in perfect balance. So when you have 50-50 front and back, you have pi, and you can measure that, that the tip of the frog to the front of the toe and from the coronet down to the front of the toe is pi. Interesting. So it's a confirmation that the 50-50 works. That's amazing. 5, 000, but yeah, 5,000 years of thought is not wrong. Couldn't be. No. It That's isn't. amazing. How many people... Yeah. Is this something you learned in, in when you were going to school for farrier work or no? Oh, God, no. I, I, I learned it too late. Oh. <laughs> I learned how to balance the foot from the great Harry Patton, but I didn't know what I was doing. Uh -huh. I just learned it because he trained me. But uh -huh. when I started measuring feet and I applied pi to it, I, I, it confirmed everything in my, okay. in my 35 years of experience. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. Well, if people go on your website, harrypatton.com, can they learn a little bit more? Do you recommend farriers? What, what do they find there? Well, they'll, they, they'll, whether they go to your website or my website, they will find the ruler. I don't have too much information other than that what it does. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should add that to the website. But, but basically, it's all in the kit. The kit's $35. I mean, I'm not here to sell anything, but... The, the mm -hmm. kit really sort of tells you everything. I see. So, so people who find harrypatton.com, I know you sell farrier tools and equipment to the, to the thoroughbred trainers, and, and uh, you're near the racetrack there, too. Um, no, I sell to all horseshoers. All horseshoers. I have more horseshoers that shoe regular horses on the outside than I do. I, I cover all farriers. We sell okay. to all farriers who do all disciplines. That's great. Uh, so uh, do you mentor any any kids coming up now, Ada? Well, I do How? go out and tell the boys what to do. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> good for you. And oddly enough, they listen. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, they could, always, couldn't I'm resist you. Available. I'm good. always available to help anybody. Good. That's wonderful. Yeah. You're a you're a great you're a great horseman, you're a great farrier, and I appreciate you so much. 
Thank you, Debbie. God bless. Thank I you. appreciate you all, too. Thank you. Thank you, Ada Gates. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged, in England, March 15, 21, and 29, Germany, April 4, 6, 8, 11, and 13, and in Solving, May 31st, we're having another Night of Inspiration event with Monty and Pat at Flag is Up Farms. The January one is sold out, and they're filling fast. So go to MontyRoberts.com for his calendar, and you can get more information there. You can write me at Debbie at MontyRoberts.com. Give us all kinds of feedback on the show. Or you can call our offices on the Pacific Coast at 805-688-6288. Well, what a great show, Debbie. You know, that New Zealand accent, I love the New Zealand. It's my favorite accent of anybody's. Is that your favorite? uh, Wasn't she wonderful? I can listen to New Zealand women all day. Um, I don't care about the guys, (laughs) but I can listen to the women all day. Uh, Definitely. (laughs) I love how she said mare. Isn't that wonderful? Yes. No, they have a (laughs) terrific accent. I just love it. I like it. You know, it's one of my favorites. Maybe that's why I have so many New Zealand guests on my shows all the time. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, because there's only three people that live there. You know? That's right. No. That's right. <laughs> All right. Very good. Well, for details about today's show, go to horsemanshipradio.com, where you can find links, photos, and more information about our guests. Every guest we've ever had on, if you want to find a link to their website and you've forgotten, just go to Horsemanship Radio. You can go back through all the different episodes, and we have links to everybody in there. And as always, we love your feedback, so please follow us on Facebook. Uh, It's facebook.com slash Monty Roberts, and on Twitter at twitter.com slash Monty underscore Roberts. And of course, many thanks to our sponsors. None of our shows here on the Horse Radio Network would be possible without them, and they make it uh, possible for Debbie to be here each and every week. So if you like Debbie, support the sponsors. That's right. right. (laughs) Be sure to visit the other great shows uh, that Glenn has on the Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. And until next time, many happy horse hours.